Hey there, and welcome to this video. Today, we will implement a really cool article called Growing Neural Cellular Automata. It was published on Distill, and you can see it on the screen. First of all, the article itself is absolutely amazing, both because of the presented methods, but also because it contains interactive visualizations. Before I start coding, I will give you a brief summary of what the article is about. However, I would definitely encourage you to pause the video and try to go through it yourself, because it is a pleasure to read. Also, know that I won't cover all the topics, so I don't want you to miss out on anything. Anyway, the authors published their code as a Colab notebook, which you can see here. It is written in TensorFlow and I used it heavily in my PyTorch implementation. Additionally, I used two other resources that I will link in the description box below. The first one being this PyTorch implementation that I found on GitHub. And the second resource was a YouTube tutorial from the author himself, Alexander Mordvintsev. I would definitely recommend you to check these resources out for yourself. And if you never come back to my video, it's fine. I'm not going to take it personally. Anyway, all the credit goes to the authors and the performance mentioned resources. All right, let me now try to give you a very rough and high level explanation of what this article is trying to do. Personally, I try to relate it to the Conway's game of life. As you probably know, it takes place on a two dimensional grid. Each of the grid cells can either be dead or alive. First of all, we are supposed to design an initial state of the entire grid. Let's say it will look like this. Second of all, there are very simple rules that determine what happens to each of the grid cells in the next iteration. So for example, if a given cell is dead and it happens to have exactly three neighbors that are alive, the cell itself will become alive. Note that the next state of a given cell is fully determined by the cell's current state and the state of its eight immediate neighbors. So in other words, the cell cannot really look any further to determine its future state. All right, so we have the initial state and we have the rules and now we can just see what happens. So as you saw, there was a lot of movement going on and at one point the pattern became stable. Let us now try a different initial state. So we have a completely new pattern and as you would imagine, you can just play around with this forever. All right, so let me just stress that in this game of life, we are given the rules and we are supposed to choose the initial state. However, what if someone fixed the initial state and we were supposed to design the rules? More specifically, imagine somebody told us that the initial state looks like this. So we have only one cell that is alive and it's exactly in the middle of our grid. And now our goal would be to write this explanation section. But instead of using these rules, we have the freedom to choose anything we want. And of course, you can play around with this and you can come up with infinitely many rules. However, let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's say somebody gives us the target state of the grid that we want to achieve. And he or she asks us, can you find the rules that given this simple initial state will get me to the final state in a fixed number of iterations, let's say. So for example, let's say I want the final grid state to be this beautiful smiley. And I'm asking you to find the rules that will get me there, let's say in 100 iterations, starting from the simple initial state. And if I simplify, that is exactly what the article is about. It proposes a way how to use deep learning, namely the convolution operation, to learn rules that will result in some specific grid configuration. Anyway, this was just to give you a very intuitive explanation. However, our setup is going to be a little bit more complicated. So first of all, instead of having a grid of booleans, we will be actually working with an image where each cell would equal one pixel. And therefore, each of the cells can have multiple floats associated with it. And additionally, not only we will have the RGB channels to store cell information, but we will also have multiple other channels, let's say hidden states, that will encode all the information about a given cell. All right, first of all, let me explain how we can use the convolution operation to update our grid and define rules. Here I define a two-dimensional grid and one way you can think about this is just a simple grayscale image. And instead of the values being just true or false, we can actually have any number between zero and one as the value. Let me now define a new tensor that will represent the rules. 
So these rules are nothing else than a filter we will convolve the input grid with. Know that this rules filter is three times three, and that means that we are only allowed to look at the immediate neighbors and the cell itself, which is exactly the same constraint that we saw with the game of life. And what is this rule actually doing? Well, for a given cell, we just look at the neighbor that is right above and the neighbor that is right below, and we define the new value to be their average. To actually perform the convolution, we will use the following function. All right, so this is the doc string, feel free to read it. And I am just going to use this function to perform the convolution. All right, so as you can see, the two main inputs are the initial grid and the rules. I played around with the dimensions of those tensors so that things work out, but don't worry about it. And this is how the grid looks after one iteration. And right, let's just verify whether it did what was expected. So if you look at this cell, for example, we want it to be a average of this number and this number. Yeah. And now nothing actually prevents us from just repeating this procedure as many times as we want. And lastly, let me point out that the rules tensor is something I created. However, what we actually want is to turn this tensor into a learnable parameter and just learn it. We are now ready to jump into the article. What you see here is one iteration of the pipeline and it is actually slightly more complicated than sliding a single three by three filter over our input image. First of all, our input is going to be an RGBA image where the A stands for the alpha channel plus 12 additional channels to store any additional information. The first step is to convolve the image with three different 3x3 filters. First of them is going to be the identity filter that just results in copying the input image. The second and the third filter are Sobel filters in the x and y directions respectively. Note that the idea behind using the Sobel filter is to approximate the gradient and thus to give ourselves some information on what the intensities of the neighboring pixels are. The authors claim that this is actually inspired by real biological cells and chemical gradients, which which I cannot really comment on. However, from the machine learning point of view, this is an interesting design choice because the other and maybe more natural approach would be to learn these three by three filters from scratch. I guess the main benefit of hard coding these filters is having fewer learnable parameters and also that we introduce a very reasonable prior into the neural network. Anyway, in our implementation, we'll follow what the paper did and hard code these filters. However, note that in the other video that I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the author actually just learns the three by three filters from scratch. After applying our three filters to the 16 channel image, we end up with a 48 channel image. We then apply two one by one convolutions, which is nothing else than applying a linear model for each pixel over all channels. I guess I will describe this in detail later. The last operation is called the stochastic update and it is more or less a pixel wise dropout. Finally, we take this image and we add it to the input one. And that is nothing else than a residual block. Finally we will check the alpha channel of the image. If it's below 0.1, we will just consider that given cell dead and manually set the channels to zero. And this process is called a live masking. What we saw before was a single iteration of applying the rule. However, we actually want to take our input image and run it through the same pipeline multiple times. In this diagram, you can clearly see that once we take multiple steps, we simply take our predicted image, namely the first four channels and the target image and compute the the L2 loss. And there you go, we have our deep learning pipeline. Anyway, I guess that's it for the explanations. And in my opinion, the implementation is pretty straightforward. So let's just get started. All right, first of all, we implement the model. The first parameter determines the number of channels of the input image. In the article, this is actually equal to 16. Since we are going to run the one by one convolution twice, we can decide on any number of hidden channels. So the file rate determines how probable it is that a given cell is going to go through the update process. And finally, we provide the device so that we can easily switch between the CPU and the GPU. So internally, we will create this update module, which is nothing else than two one by one convolutions. And what's really important is that this will be the only block of our pipeline that is going to have learnable parameters. Internally, we also store this filter tensor that will represent the identity filter and the Sobel filter in the X and Y direction. As always, we call the constructor of the parent. 
If the user doesn't provide a device specifically, we will default to a CPU. So first of all, we need to prepare the filters for the so-called perceived step. This step is nothing else than a three by three convolution. So we define manually the so-called Sobel filter and what it does is approximation of the gradient. And again, the idea behind it is to tell our current cell what is happening around it and in what direction it would need to go to maximize or minimize the intensity. Here we define an identity filter and if we slide this filter over any image, we will actually get exactly the same image. So here we take the three filters that we define and we just stack them together along the zero dimension. Our ultimate goal is to take these three filters and apply them to each of the channels of the input image. And therefore we will end up with a new image that will have three times as many channels. So here we just repeated the filters over all channels and we send them to the right device. And finally, we store them internally as an attribute because we will use them in the forward pass. Let me just stress again one very important thing. These filters are not learnable. We manually hard coded them. So now we want to prepare the so-called update step. This is the only place where we will have trainable parameters. We use the sequential module to define three consecutive steps. We apply the one by one convolution, then the ReLU activation, and finally, again, another one by one convolution. Let me quickly explain the relation between the linear model and the one by one convolution. All right, so we define a couple of constants. And here I have defined a random tensor that represents a patch of uh, different images. Let me now instantiate two different torch modules. So here I created the one by one convolution layer. And here I created a simple linear model. First of all, let me just check the number of parameters each of them has. So as you can see, they have the same number of parameters. These parameters are actually stored in the following two attributes. So as we can see, the bias and the weight of the linear and the convolution layer are more or less matching, except for some extra dimensions. And I guess at this point, you realize that what I want to say or what I want to show is that these two modules are more or less doing the same thing. When we do one by one convolution, it's nothing else than iterating over all pixels and applying the same linear model across all the channels. And let me just prove it to you. So what I did here was to make sure that the bias and the weight of the convolutional layer is exactly the same as the weight and the bias of the linear layer. Note that when we constructed them, these parameters were just initialized randomly. And now the idea is to run a forward pass with our random tensor and see whether we would get the same result. Note that I actually had to permute the dimensions of the input sensor in order for it to be usable with the linear module. However, then I actually undid it after the forward pass. First of all, let us check the shapes. They seem to be the same. And also these two tensors seem to be the same element wise if we disregard tiny differences. To summarize, one by one convolution is nothing else than a linear model that is applied to all pixels across the channels. All right, we're back in the implementation. So since we're using the one by one convolution, we will be never looking at the neighbors. And we're hoping that by now, all the information is already encoded in the channels. And that is actually a reasonable assumption because as we saw in the previous step, we already included a lot of information about the neighbors via the Sobel filters. To understand what I'm doing here, let me just remind you that our seed starting image is going to be a single bright pixel in the middle of the image. All the other pixels, or you can call them cells, will be non-active. And by adjusting the weights and the bias of this second one by one convolution, we're making sure it will actually take a couple of iterations of this rule to populate the pixels that are further away from the center. And I guess the main motivation behind this is to make the training simpler and just make sure we don't end up with some crazy complicated pattern just after the first iteration. Finally, we recursively send all the parameters of this module to our desired device. All right, so now we're done with our constructor and we can write a couple of helper methods that will finally be put together to create the forward pass. So 
So here we implement the perceive step. Its goal is to look at the surrounding pixels or cells and understand how the intensity changes. There are no learnable parameters here. When it comes to the input and output shapes, as you can see, they're the same except for the number of channels. We actually multiply the number of channels by three because we apply three filters to each of them. So we take the filters we prepared in the constructor and we just perform a so-called depthwise convolution. And we achieve this by setting groups equal to the number of input channels. All right, let us now implement the update step. Again, the update step is the only place where we have trainable parameters and it's exactly those parameters inside of the two one by one convolution layers. And it's just a one-liner because we prepared everything in the constructor. Next step to implement is the stochastic update. Stochastic update is nothing else than a pixel-wise dropout. However, note that we're not actually scaling the remaining values by any scalar. Let me just point out that this step, as well as the others, has a biological rationale. We don't want all the cells to be updated with each iteration, which would kind of imply that there's this global clock and with each iteration, everybody updates. What we want is for this process to be more or less random. So let's say if I focus on a given cell, I want it to update only 80% of the time, independently of its neighbors. So first of all, we create a Boolean mask for each pixel, and then we just element-wise multiply the original tensor with the mask. Note that this mask is going to be broadcasted over all the channels. So it cannot happen that some channels of a given pixels are active and the remaining ones are inactive. So this utility function will actually take the alpha channel of our image, which will be the fourth one, and it will use it to determine whether a given cell is alive or not. And the criterion here is that if the cell itself or any cell in the neighborhood has an alpha channel higher than 0.1, this cell will be considered as alive. All right, and now we have all we need to implement the forward method. Let me just remind you that calling the forward method once in our case will mean nothing else than one iteration of the rule. What we will actually do while training is to call the forward method multiple times to simulate multiple iterations. First of all, we will create a pre-life mask, which will be a tensor of booleans. We take our input tensor and run the perceive step, which applies the identity and the two Sobel filters. Then we run the update step that contains learnable parameters here we run the stochastic update and the goal of it is to make sure that some cells don't get updated during this forward pass and thus making it more biologically plausible. Here we actually use a residual block and it's really important because the new image is nothing else than the previous image plus some delta image. And I guess here one can make the same argument as with ResNet. We will run this forward method multiple times and one way to think about this is that you're just creating a very deep architecture. We compute the post-life mask. The final life mask is going to be an element-wise end operator between the pre-life mask and the post-life mask. All right, and that is it for the forward pass. Right now we want to write the training script. So here we load an RGBA image and we pre-multiply the RGB channels with the alpha channel. And finally, we turn it into a torch tensor and make sure that the channels are actually the second dimension. We take an RGBA image and we turn it into an RGB image. Note that we use the torch clamp to make sure we are not falling outside of the range uh, 0 and 1 and we want the background to be white.
Here we create our initial grid state. It is nothing else than a blank image. What we will do is to take its center pixel and we will set all the channels except for RGB equal to one. All right, now we would like to create a command line interface because there are multiple parameters that one can play around with. I'm going to explain some of these arguments when we actually use them in the code. We parse the arguments and we just print them out to see the configuration. We instantiate the device based on the CLI option. Here we prepare the TensorBoard writer. Here we load the target image and we pad it on all four of the borders. Know that we do this to kind of prevent overfitting since we don't want the network to rely on the fact that there are borders nearby. And finally, we just take the same image and repeat it. That is because we want to do batch training. We also add this target image to TensorBoard. We instantiate the model that we wrote and we also create an optimizer. Here I need to provide more explanation. Instead of always starting from the seed image and then trying to get to the target image, we will create a pool of images that should ideally contain all in-between states together with the target one and also the seed image. The main idea of this pool is to make sure that once we reach the final pattern, more iterations are not going to degrade this pattern. You will see how the pool is being updated in a couple of lines. All right, now we're trying to write our training loop. Most importantly, we will take number of batches gradient steps. We will randomly select a couple of samples from our pool and that way we will create a batch. This part is really important because we will take our batch and we will just run it through our forward pass multiple times. And the number of iterations is actually not going to be deterministic. It's going to be just randomly sampled from the interval 64 to 96. We are hoping that around 70 iterations should be enough to go from the seed image all the way to the target image. Here we compute per sample mean squared error. Note that we are only extracting the first four channels out of our predicted image. And that is because the target image itself only contains the RGBA channels. We compute an average loss over all samples in the batch. And then we just take the gradient step and lock the loss with TensorBoard. So here we're trying to update our pool. First of all, we find a sample for which the loss was the highest. And we make an assumption that this sample was terrible and that we actually do not want to keep it in that pool. So what we do is that we just replace this bad sample with the initial seed sample. When it comes to the other samples in a batch, we actually throw them back into the pool. But what's important, it's the updated version of them, not the initial one. This way, we are hoping to create a pool that will contain all kinds of different images that represent different stages of the development of our final pattern. This is just a logging block that will create a video for TensorBoard. And the idea is that each frame will represent different iteration. However, we would like to run it for way more iterations. In our case, it will be 300. And the number of iterations we trained it for, which was in the range of 60 and 90. This way, we'll be able to assess whether the pattern, once it reaches its final form, the target image, stays stable.
All right, and that's it. Now we just need to train it. First of all, let us verify whether the CLI was created correctly. It seems to be the case. Note that to train, we need to have a target image, which I have here. What's important is that it's an RGBA image so that it has the alpha channel. All right, so now I will just launch the training. Note that to get decent results in a matter of minutes, one needs to use a GPU. Anyway, I'll just let it train. And once it's done, I'll just show you the results in the tensor board. All right, first of all, you can see that the loss is consistently going down. When it comes to the videos, we can see that after 500 gradient steps, the rule is kind of able to reproduce the general shape of the rabbit's face. However, it is far from perfect. Additionally, it seems like artifacts appear after a certain number of steps and therefore it is not stable. If we look at the rule towards the end of the training, we can see that it is pretty good and stable. Let me just point out that I did not cover regeneration. One can actually perturb the image during the training and that way we can force the rule to be able to deal with degenerate images. Also, I did not cover the rotating of the Sobel filters once the model is trained. What happens is that the actual image rotates too, which is uh, really impressive. Anyway, that's it for the video. All the credit goes to the authors. I hope I managed to interpret their research correctly. Additionally, I made a lot of modifications and simplifications in the code, and I hope that I did not introduce too many mistakes. Anyway, I hope you managed to learn new things and that you found this video interesting. I will continue creating similar content in the future, so do not hesitate to subscribe. I wish you a nice rest of the day and I will see you next time.